on. You know, if you guys haven't checked out this Heritage line from Native by Carlton, they're pretty cool. So, open read cow calls, but they uh, come with different voices. So, I know I'm a few minutes early, but we see people jumping on. So, all right, everybody, welcome to Wapiti Wednesday Q and A. I am Michael Batiste from the Elk Calling Academy, where we help you shorten the learning curve to find success faster in the elk woods through elk call reviews, gear reviews, plus elk calling lessons, tips, and tutorials, a lot like this one. So tonight we are going to kind of talk about um, final preparation checklist. You know, we are about two weeks in away in some states from elk season open and, um, you know, roughly about a month in other areas. So this is this is the time where you should pretty much have everything dialed in and ready. But I'm going to run down a list of kind of some of the things that sometimes get overlooked or things that um you know you should already be doing if you're not doing them so okay first off shooting broadheads right now is the time that you should be shooting broadheads and only broadheads so you should have made the transition from um you know field points to broadheads and i will shoot broadheads from this point all the way up until season starts and even when i'm in camp you know do do some shooting in camp to make sure gear is still tuned arrows are flying good but the thing is is i only shoot one shot groups because i am more concerned about that first shot uh you know because that's the one we want to make count it's not like we're sitting there getting two, three, four, five, or even six shots at a bull, it's that one. So that's why I shoot one arrow on this at different yardages, and then I'll go down and pull it from the target. Um, you know, just make sure form and everything like that is on. But the other nice thing about only shooting one broadhead is you don't have to worry about shaving veins or exploding knocks. Um, you know, dinging up or marking up the blades on the broadhead. So that's why, you know, I, I have the broadheads on all of my arrows. So I have, I have the broadheads on, I've done spin testing on the arrows, uh, making sure everything spins well. And then I have that one arrow and that's what I continue to practice with. So, okay. Other thing, we kind of touched on it a couple of weeks ago, the um, elk hunter starter kit or the kill kit, you know, making sure you have everything put together. But more importantly than that, if, if this is your first time going elk hunting, um, hopefully you've done research on an elk and watched some videos. There's plenty of videos you can pull up on how to break down an elk in the field. You know, and there's a lot of ways you can do it. You can do the no mess way of cleaning. Uh, you can take the quarters off, leave the bone in, you can bone it out. It's kind of personal preference, but also where you're at. So, I mean, if you're, um, you know, six, seven, eight miles in the backcountry, obviously you wanna bone that animal out just to eliminate, you know, even more of the weight. Um, if, you know, you're a little closer, then it's really, you know, up to you whether you want to leave bone in or bone out. My preference is, is I prefer bone in, uh, just because it's easier to handle, it's easier to hang, get that meat cooled down. So now the other thing is, is what preparations have you made for getting that meat off the mountain? Are you planning on, you know, using your using your pack to get it off the mountain, get it back up to camp? But then also, what is the temperature? Because the biggest thing is you have to get that meat cooled down. Um, you know, elk have, uh, well, pretty much any wild game has a pretty aggressive bacteria in the meat. And so you really want to get it cooled down quick. So how are you going to keep that cool? Um especially during the first part of the season when it's when it's hotter. So um, again, if, if you're going out of state, have you done research of the nearby town? Is there a meat locker that you can go and hang that meat at 
or maybe there's a butcher, you know, nearby that I know one year when we hunted Colorado, we got, we got a bull down early enough in the week that, uh, you know, we ran it to town, took it to a butcher. And by the time we were done with our hunt, he had it cut and wrapped and, uh, had been frozen. So make sure you do research around the area that you're going and, you, you know, make these kind of provisions, call around, make these arrangements. Um, don't start thinking about meat care once the animal's on the ground, because then it's too late. So maybe you're going to just put it in coolers. Well, do you have enough coolers? Also, if you have enough coolers, do you have enough ice? And how are you going to keep that ice? Um, because the thing you got to remember too, is the things that cause meat store meat spoilage is heat, dirt, and water. So obviously the last thing you want to do is, you know, take some elk meat, throw it in a cooler with ice and let that ice just melt and turn to water and then just get all, get all over the meat. Um, you know, that will stop that skinning process uh, of the meat. Cause when you hang meat, it, it, it kind of gets this hard skin, this hard film on it. So, um, but definitely make sure you have arrangements for keeping that cool. Now, the other thing also is backup plans. Um, especially, like I said, if, if you're going to, um, you know, a new area or you're going out of state, you've never been there before. You've looked at it on the map, you've talked to people, but that's no guarantee that there's animals there. And the last thing you want to do is show up there and then there's no animals. And then you're trying to figure out where to go. These are all preparations that should be made. Now you should have five or six spots located on a map. I mean, even if you have three or four, but you want to have multiple spots pegged on a map and pinned that somehow, you know, if, if you're researching it on a computer, like on X, for example, you want to make sure those pins and those points are getting to your phone. So when you get out there, if things aren't quite like you expected, you know, like I said, no animals or maybe just an abundance of people or, you know, there's a fire, you know, you have these, you have these backup plans. Uh, let's see, Jimmy been trying to get a hold of people out there for a meat locker and no one seems to know of any places. You know, Jimmy, what you might have to do is, you know, kind of, kind of do, you, you know, drop a pin on the map and, you know, even if you have to go two hours in any direction, but just draw a radius, see what towns fall within that radius. Um, you know, two hours, three hours. I mean, I know it's it's one of those things, but, you know, if it's a six hour round trip, you get up early in the morning, you leave at first light, you drive the three hours to wherever that meat locker is, maybe grab some more provisions that you need and get back. You haven't lost a whole day. You've just lost that morning. But that's a lot better than losing all of that meat that you've worked so hard to get on the ground um, just because it's spoiled. Now, there are things you can do. Um, yeah, you just did it within 60 miles. Now, there are things that you guys can do that you can build meat caches in the backcountry or when you're out in the mountains. If you're camped near a creek that has some really shaded areas, you know, you can you can basically build a grid system with, you know, pretty hefty branches and that's elevated up above the water. And, you know, you can lay that meat out there. So that cool air of the creek just circulates around that. Um, you know, other things that we've done in the past is we put up a meat pole. We put a tarp over the top of it. We've hung our quarters and then we've hung blocks of ice you know, from those poles and then just kind of, you know, sealed up the, the tarp. So it held in quite a bit of that, that coolness. So there are things that you can do to kind of build backcountry meat caches or, um, you know, right there at your, at your base camp. You know, the other thing too is, is if you are going in the backcountry, how are you going to get that meat out? Are you, packing it out. Well, the thing is, is if you're eight miles back in, you know, depending on the number of guys, you might be looking at two or three trips to get that bull out. 
Well, then that's the case that you might call outfitters in that area. And some outfitters will actually come in and haul your meat out for you. So a lot of times with those, you have to meet them at a trail, but they will sometimes, you know, pull that out. And I'll tell you what, you know, 250, 300 bucks for them to come in and, and, you know, pull that bull out is, is, is worth it, you know, to pull that meat out and, um, you know, they'll, they'll keep it cool for you. And, but that meat cache above the creek, that's another great thing that you can do if you're back in the back country. So, John, what do you recommend for size and number of coolers? You know, it really depends on what you're doing, John. If you're boning it out, um, I mean, obviously, if you're going to stick it in coolers, I'd recommend boning it out um, and then have some sort of shelf in that cooler that keeps that meat up off the bottom. So, you know, your ice is underneath and you have that shelf system and then your meat's on it but that shelf system has to have holes in it to allow that cool air to circulate. Um, you know, but it could take four or five coolers, you know, depending on the, depending on the size of cooler, obviously, you know, larger coolers, you know, work better. You can put more in them, but uh, remember the more meat you put in a cooler, the heavier it's going to get. So, um, you know, usually, especially here in Idaho, you know, where, where I'm hunting. Um, one of us in one of us in the group, whoever got the bull down, will usually make a morning run and just run it to camp if it's warm, especially during the first part of the season, you know, run to town, get it to the butcher, get it hung. Now, the thing I like to hang my elk for seven to 10 days before they even cut it up. A lot of butchers want to jump on it, cut it up immediately, get it in, get it out. So if it's middle to later of the season, as, as long as it's getting under 50 degrees at night, and I'm not talking 49, I'm talking where it's getting good under 50 degrees at night, and you've pulled those game bags off, that nighttime cool air will cool that meat off enough, especially if you're hanging it in the shade or if you're by a creek where it's shady and cool anyways, um, you know, you'll, you'll be okay to let it hang for a few days. The other thing you want to do is on that hind quarter. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term bone sour. So what can happen sometimes is those large chunks of meat can actually trap heat in next to the bone, especially on the hind quarter. So when you have the hind quarter hung up, and you feel on the front, you'll feel a bone that feels like a kneecap. And then you'll see kind of this line that starts right underneath it and goes down the side. If you take your knife and come right underneath that kneecap, right on that line and cut in until you hit bone and then angle it down that bone, you're gonna see this big chunk of meat just fall out. And that's letting all that heat escape that's trapped in there next to the bone. So that is what you, definitely want to get out. You want to get that heat out. So, all right, next on the list is food. What are you going to eat? And do you have enough provisions, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, because you're going to be burning a lot of energy out there. So you need a lot of calories to replace it. Um, you know, there's a lot of options on backcountry meals. Um, I know I was going to do, or, or I was going to try to do a video on backcountry uh, meals and camp options before season started, but with everything on the list and the way everything's going, I don't know if I'm going to get to it before season, but I definitely will get that video going to kind of give you some other options that you can create your own backcountry meals where you control the portion size, you control the seasonings for your flavor, you control the amount of sodium in them, um, but you can make some really, really good meals your, yourself. So, all right, um, abstract one. What do you think about the rut progression in Idaho for September? When do you think they'll peak this season? I read the equinox will be the 25th. Okay, actually the autumn equinox is on the 22nd this year. Um, now, I kind of, you know, touched on this, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the best week to, to hunt. So the things I do is I look at the autumn equinox for that current year, 
what the moon phase calendar is going to be. But then also I go to Farmer's Almanac and um, also do a Google search for winter predictions for the upcoming winter because I kind of want to get an idea. So it depends on what part of Idaho you're in or what part you're hunting. So what I've seen for winter prediction is Western Idaho is going to have a normal winter year. Eastern Idaho is going to have a above normal snowfall. So what that's telling me is Western side of the state is going to kind of have a normal rut period, which means that seven to 10 day time frame around that 22nd um, is, is going to be a good time to hunt. So, um, you know, I would say, you know, 15th, 16th of September through about the 25th, 26th, somewhere in that, that window is going to be a pretty good time frame for peak rut in Idaho this year. So abstract, hopefully that, uh, answered your question. Oh, if, if you're on the East side of the state, it's probably going to be a little bit later, which means it's probably going to be the tail end of September, maybe even to, into the first part of October for the rut. So, all right, next up is, is gear. Do you have all of your gear put together? Meaning your camouflage is all washed and non-scent. It's put in non-scent um, type containers. You have all your camping gear. You've checked everything. Everything works. It's functional. You have batteries. You have um, you know, everything that you may need. If you're using a jet boil or anything like that, you have all your fuel canisters. Um, now is the time to go through all of your gear and make sure it's in proper working order. When you show up to hunt and camp, that is not the time to start checking everything out. Now is because you still have time that you can fix things. So, okay. And then also pack training. Hopefully you are doing some hikes with your pack on. Even, even if you, if, if you live in the city, even if you put your pack on, and do a mile or two in your neighborhood each day uh, when you're shooting your bow you have your pack on you're conditioning your shoulders guys i promise you if you are not putting your pack on and doing pack training you're going to be fine the first day or two but then all of a sudden your shoulders are going to start getting sore because you haven't conditioned those muscles you haven't gotten used to the pack but also when you're shooting and you're practicing if you're not practicing with your pack on Guys, it does make a difference. You may get caught up into a setup where you don't have time to drop your pack. You have to shoot with it on. Well, how's that going to feel in your draw cycle? How is it going to affect your draw cycle? So, um, you know, your pack, your bino harness, whatever you're going to have when you're out there hunting, you need to be practicing with those right now. And you need to be getting your body used to those things right now. So, you know, all these things that I'm kind of talking about are, they don't take a lot of time to really go through, but they will make all the difference in the world once you get to camp. It's going to enhance your hunt. It's going to enhance your experience. It's just going to make, because the worst thing you want to do is get to camp and have problems. Um, if you are taking a camp trailer to camp, make sure everything is in working order. Um, all your batteries are good. Your propane tanks are full. Your tires are good. Um, your brakes on the trailer are good. All your connections are good because unfortunately rodents and mice and this and that can get in your trailer and chew on wiring and they can just wreak all kinds of habit, ha havoc during, you know, winter storage. So make sure you're checking all of this stuff out. So, all right, guys. So um, Friday, I know I had kind of hinted that I was going to do a video on that backcountry hammock sleep system. I'm actually going to push that video to next week. So because this weekend I am heading to Etna, Wyoming to Archery Unlimited to where I am doing seminars Friday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Different subjects on both days, but what I talk about Friday night is going to lead into Saturday so if you guys are within 200 miles of Etna, 
try to get there for the seminar. For you guys that live outside that area, Friday night, I am actually going to broadcast live for Friday night's seminar. So I have created an event on here. So if you guys are subscribed to the channel, you'll get notified. If you're not subscribed, make sure you subscribe so that as soon as I go live Friday night in that seminar, you'll be notified and come join us. Now, the cool thing is I will have somebody monitoring um, the YouTube live feed. So you will be able to ask questions during that seminar. And it's just like, you'll be right there. You'll be able to interact. You'll be able to ask your questions. So definitely tune in and have a lot of fun. So, all right, guys, hopefully that kind of gives you a little bit of a checklist, kind of some last minute preparation things to run it, run down. Season is coming fast guys. It's going to be here before we know it. So as always, guys, thanks for tuning in. I greatly appreciate the support from you guys. You guys are absolutely awesome. So as always, keep calling, keep practicing, but most importantly, have fun, guys.